Father, there are so many who have given so much. I'm not speaking of the offering tonight, though that may certainly be true, but there are so many who have given so much time, talent, sweat, strength, effort. Throughout the years, so many, so many. Some are able to be here tonight. Many are not able to be here tonight. Some have gone home to be with the Lord. Some have gone on into other avenues of ministry. But God, we thank you that their seed, their toll, their work, their effort is not in vain. We stand here tonight and we claim a hundredfold harvest on everything that's been sown into this ministry. Everyone who's ever given, who's ever prayed, who's ever volunteered, who's ever given of themselves, we pray right now a hundredfold return on them in the name of Jesus. Let their house be visited by your presence. Let their families be saved. Their finances prosper. Let their bodies be healed. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit descend upon them in a fresh and a new way they've never experienced before. In the mighty name of Jesus, would you do him the honor of giving him three or four hallelujahs worthy of his name? You may remain standing as you grab your Bibles and open them with me to 1 Samuel. Thank you. To 1 Samuel chapter number 3. I came here to do business for the kingdom tonight. As we step into a new season, we're so happy to see all of you here, so many old faces and, <laughs> and some new faces. And, and let me tell you this, if you're saved, you're family. We, we just... We just love you. That's one of the reasons why when we started this ministry, we said, you know what? Everybody's a member. Everybody. Everybody's a member. I go to other church. Well, you're still a member. You're still a member. Because we're all members of the body of Christ. We're all members of one great, big, godly family. Thank God for it. We may be the deranged uncle in the family, but we're all, we're all members of the same family. And we're so happy to see you here. So happy to see Scott and Patricia all the way up from Gainesville, Georgia. They've just started an amazing ministry down there, and we couldn't be prouder of them, and we'll see what the Lord does. They might have something to share with you later today. Thank you, praise and worship team. If you'd like to make your way down to the amen corner, we would like to have you there. And we know that there are many joining us online, and we're so glad to have you with us tonight. And we pray that you'll dig in with us because this is Pentecost. Hallelujah. Probably the most important event on God's calendar that has been fulfilled in Scripture, Pentecost, a time of renewing, a revitalization, a refreshing of the Spirit of God, a time when God speaks from heaven. The first Pentecost, of course, was when God descended on Mount Sinai and gave the word, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And tonight we pray for a fresh word from heaven. Hallelujah. We're not talking about a new word that is equal to this word. We're talking about him just taking the cover off the word he has already given us. And we will begin tonight in 1 Samuel chapter number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. Three, and if you're there, say glory. glory. And the <laughs> ECC. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days, for there was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. 
Father, let that be our answer tonight as we endeavor to dig into your presence through the passage of your word. We thank you we will find safe passage on the sound principles of doctrine tonight. And as we tread softly over the word that has been given us, we thank you we will be found safely in the arms of Jesus with a radically new and fresh encounter with his presence. We believe you to do something significant tonight. Let a word be spoken that like a seed will germinate in our hearts and spring forth into new light. God, put me on like you put Gideon on and speak through me and let them hear the thus saith the Lord for them and for their house and for this church. We believe you to do it. We stand in faith for you to do it for what things soever we desire. When we pray, if we believe we receive it, we shall have it. Hallelujah. How many of you believe you received tonight? In the mighty name of Jesus. Well, then you can be seated as you just give God a couple more hallelujahs worthy of his name. And the Bible says the child Samuel grew in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and ministered unto the Lord. Would you look at your neighbor and say, uh huh, he ministered? Don't say it like I did. Say it full, full third. He, he, he ministered. I'm sure that there are, there, are, there are young people today who are in our midst who would not appreciate being referred to as a child. Don't call me a child. I'm six. <laughs> or 16. It's just as ridiculous. There are many who would not like being referred to as a child, though they are not behaving with the maturity of this child whom the Bible says ministered unto the Lord. I just want to say this right now because I think it's a word for somebody. There has been enough mollycoddling of this generation. There's been enough petting them and taking care of them and making sure that they had everything they needed. There was a time, you understand, when nine-year-olds would have to get up way before the sun came up to tend to the cows in the morning and then when they got home from school they had to tend to the field and then when Papa died they had to take care of the family. I think we've done a little bit too much molly coddling of this generation. We need to let them know that there's coming a time soon and very soon, nay, it is even here when they must grow up and begin to minister unto the Lord. Stop teaching your kids. They got plenty of time to be kids. They're is no more time it's time for you child to grow up it's time for you young people to minister unto the Lord because you are at this moment surrounded in darkness you are surrounded in darkness in a generation and in a society today where more than there are more than 40 million victims of human trafficking who are in captivity right now 25% of them are children 20%, one out of six, nearly 20% of all pregnancies in the United States today end in an abortion Gender dysphoria is skyrocketing as doctors and media sow this confusion into the minds of adolescents. Nearly 20% of the population right now is professing anxiety or depression. More than 65 million Americans right now have a problem with alcohol. 65 million, not counting their families who are affected by it as well. Every day, 130 people die of an opioid overdose in the United States, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thousands are dying every single year from STD-related deaths, and millions more are being infected as our political discourse has taken a nosedive without any sign of recovery. And our news outlets do little more than propagandize for their team and their own bottom lines. Why are you saying this, Pastor? Because we need another Pentecost. We need a Pentecost of biblical proportions to baptize not just the church, but our society, our culture, and our politicians. Somebody say amen. amen. 
For the last 20 years, I have studied the revivings of God. Tonight, I'll be releasing the, the first printing of my new book, Encounter, where I, I go into the, the study that I've done of the revivals of the history and how they can impact our lives. What is a revival? A revival is anything from the revitalization of the church for a divine invasion of society to the enlisting, training, and empowering of believers as a prelude to evangelism. Everybody say revival. revival. A revival is a concentration of God's forces in preparation for a tactical blow against the kingdom of darkness. A revival is the revitalization of truth, of power, of doctrine, and of principle. When you have God bring something to your memory that you have long forgotten, that in and of itself is a revival. Revival is more than nation shaking. Revival can be house shaking. Revival, if I can today change your mind, I've sparked and started the embers of revival in your house and in your life. And if you allow that spark to grow, it'll grow and grow and grow until it touches a city and then a nation. I believe that God is about to send a mighty wave of revival across the earth. But the source of this fresh move of God will be prayer lives. Prayer lives. The source of this new move of God, let me put it this way, will be the prayer lives of believers like you. Everybody say prayer lives. Say life prayer. That's a better way to put it. Say life prayer. I'm talking about your life. I'm not talking about what you said when you said in the name of Jesus and then ended when you said amen. I'm talking about a life prayer. This revival, this new force for good in our society and in our culture is only going to come as your life becomes an expression of the ache and the will of God Almighty. We often speak of power today in the modern church in selfish terms and in childish terms. When we talk about power, it's like looking at the branches on the tree waving and we say, look at the wind. That's not the wind. That's the effects of the wind. What a childish view of the wind. And when we look at Pentecost, often we see the effects of Pentecost. We see the sound and the fire and the fury, but we don't look at the source of it. The Bible said in Psalm 103 and verse 7, He made known His ways unto Moses and His deeds to the children of Israel. Which one do you want to be? Just the one who's seeing the wind, the, the wind and the effects of it by the leaves moving? or do you want to know where the wind came from and how it started and how to get it started again? Moses knew the ways of Moses. Most look at Pentecost and see power, not presence. Fire, not purity. Sound, not saved ones. Everybody say saved ones. You do understand that Pentecost fell on saved ones. I hate that we have to even talk about it, but it's important. Most of the problems we deal with in the modern church today would be fixed if you would just get saved and then act like it. Well, I am saved, Pastor. Well, how about this? Would you look at your neighbor and tell him, just act like it. He told me to tell you to act like it. I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying he told me to tell you. you got to be saved and act like it. Everybody say, act like it. Stop looking for a miracle and a quick fix and start faithfully acting like you're saved and you'll get a miracle. Just act like you're saved. What characterizes Pentecost besides saved ones? Well, we talked about it this morning. Pentecost, the word itself, it means 50. Everybody say 50. It actually means within the context 50 days after. I'm helping our new camera folks. I'm not moving around too much. I'm staying, I'm staying right here. No, I'm just kidding. I want to stay here tonight because I got something I want to tell you. And I don't want to stray too far away from what the Lord told me to tell you because it might get ugly up in here. Everybody say 50 days after. 50 days after the 10 plagues of Egypt. That's what Pentecost means, 50 days after. 50 days after the parting of the Red Sea, 50 days after the deliverance from their captives, 50 days after all of that, God still has something to say. 50 days after, here's the Stanley County DiDio translation of the word Pentecost. Are you ready? He ain't done yet. Would you just write that down? He ain't done yet. Well, you can say it too. He ain't done yet. Try it again. This is what Pente what's Pentecost mean? 
They see the disciples in Acts chapter 2 had been submerged in water, but he wasn't done yet. They were about to be submerged in power. They had been touched by Jesus, but he wasn't done yet. They were about to be touched by the power of the Holy Ghost. They had been and heard a voice out of heaven, but they, he wasn't done yet. They were about to hear a mighty sound and fire was going to come out of heaven. Everybody say, he ain't done yet. And in Acts chapter 2, as Pentecost fell, do you realize they didn't expect it? They didn't know to expect this. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what was going to happen, just like some of you don't know what's going to happen tonight. But that's all right. How many of you are going to let it happen anyway? Well, you don't have any choice in the matter. It's my house anyway, so you're just going to have to deal with it. Everybody say, he ain't done yet. In Acts chapter 2, when they received, they saw, they walked with Jesus, first of all. They saw him wipe the blindness out of Bartimaeus' eyes. They saw him raise the dead. And then he said to them, it's better for you that I go away. They couldn't even imagine what it meant. And then in Acts chapter number 2, they were fulfilled exceedingly abundantly above all they could ask or think with, fat, with the sound from heaven and the fire from heaven and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance they didn't know to look for it and yet there it was and they thought this must be it we got it all but guess what oh you're getting it now two chapters later they begin to suffer persecution t -t 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 talking in tongues always brings persecution they begin to suffer persecution and they said Lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of your holy child Jesus and the Bible said the place was shaken in Acts chapter 4 and they were all filled once again with the Holy Ghost and they thought it don't get much better than this but guess what a few chapters later Peter gets called to a heathen's house named Cornelius a man of the Italian band I don't know what kind of music it was but it must have been pretty good the Italian band it's all right you'll get it when you're on your way home tonight and Peter goes into the house and he begins to open his mouth and before he can even get a few sentences out of his mouth the Holy Ghost falls and these heathens begin to t -t 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 talk in tongues and he was bewildered and befuddled. They had to go back and have a council meeting in Jerusalem to say, is this God? I don't know. And then they realized that it was because of the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And they thought, well, this is it. This is as good as it gets. God is reaching the whole wide world with the power of his Holy Spirit. But I got news for you. He ain't done yet. We go a few chapters later into Acts chapter number 18, and there's a man named Apollos. He's a man who's been baptized by John in the water, and he's preaching salvation through the power of Jesus Christ, but he has not experienced the power of the Holy Ghost yet, and Aquila and Priscilla come to him, and the Bible says in verse 26, they explain the way of God to him more perfectly. And what they basically did is that here's the Holy Ghost. And then the Bible said he began to preach in power. And they thought, wow, this is pretty good, but... Go to Acts chapter number 19. Paul approaches some disciples at Ephesus, and he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? What an odd question. I thought I got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. You did, but guess what? <laughs> There's always more to God than what you have. Always, always, always more to God. No matter how spiritual you think you are, the moment you think you're spiritual, you're not. There's always more to God to what you have. And they said, we have not so much as heard whether they be any Holy Ghost. He said, well, how were you baptized? They said, we were baptized in water. And, and the Apostle Paul said, well, that was good, but I got news for you. He laid his hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost and power. Would you just put your hand on your head and maybe one on your heart and declare this right now concerning yourself? Say, he ain't done yet. Look at your neighbor right now and tell him, I may not look blessed right now, but he ain't done yet. <laughs> Woo! Pastor, my marriage is hurting. He ain't done yet. Pastor, I'm struggling in my finances. He ain't done yet. I still got this pain in my knee. He ain't. 
I'm here to tell you God has more in store than you could possibly ever dream, hope, or imagine. And in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, ere the lamp of God was about to go out, but God was not done yet. He was about ready to raise up a prophet. And on that day, on the day of Pentecost, when religious Old Testament Pentecostal pageantry was interrupted by paraclete power, the church received an endowment to accomplish the command that was given in Genesis, replenish the earth and subdue it. God will not be satisfied to see peace-producing, soul-saving, tongue-talking power in the church only. It's time to have a cultural Pentecost, a political Pentecost, a Hollywood Pentecost. Too many Christians have themselves bogged down between Calvary and the upper room. They went to Calvary for pardon, but they've never been to Pentecost for power. It's time to walk in this thing, young people. It's time for you to pull up your bootstraps. It doesn't matter whether you're 9 or 90. It's time for you to become a carrier of this fire and a carrier of this power to a generation that is in need. It's time to walk in this thing. It's time for our political system to receive a baptism in the Holy Ghost. What is it that can bridge the gap between Pentecost and politics? What can bridge the gap between Pentecostals and politicians? A prophet. I've come this night to ask you to pray with me that God would cause the prophets to arise again. A prophet of his day is fully accepted by God, but he is totally rejected by man. In case you're confused about what a prophet is, I'm going to lay it out for you. The prophet comes to set up that which will be upset. His work is to call into line those who are out of line. He is unpopular because he challenges the popular in morality and spirituality. And in a day of preaching politicians and political preachers, there's no more urgent need than that we cry out that God would send a prophet once again to this nation and once again to his church. Somebody say, give us a prophet. The foundation and the function of a prophet is that of recovery. He is a detective seeking lost spiritual treasures, and the degree of his effectiveness is determined by the measure of his unpopularity. Compromise is not known to him. He does not have a price tag. He is totally otherworldly. He marches to the beat of a different drummer. He breathes the rarefied air of inspiration. He lives in the high of God and comes down into the valley to declare a thus saith the Lord. He partakes of God's foreknowledge so he is aware of impending judgment. His message is not sow a seed and get blessed. His message is repent, be reconciled to God or else. He didn't read how to win, friend and win friends and influence the people. So he's the villain of today, but the hero of tomorrow. His truth brings torment, but his voice is never void. He is excommunicated while he's alive and then exalted when he's dead. He is a school teacher, bringing us to Christ, but few make the grade. He talks before men for days, but has walked before God for years. He is a scourge to the nation before he's scourged by the nation. He announces, pronounces, and denounces. His heart is like a volcano, and his words are as fire. He carries the lamp of truth while he's being lampooned by heretics. He hides with God in the secret place, but has nothing to hide in the marketplace. He has purpose. He has passion. He has pugnacity. He is the prophet of God. He is ordained of God and disdained by men. He is the seer. He is the speaker of truth. He is the one who declares, thus saith the Lord. Our national need of the hour is not another boom in the economy or to save face internationally or to answer whatever that global climate change, cooling, warming situation is. What we need is a prophet. Billions have been spent by the church. Thousands of gospel crusades, 
hundreds of hours of air time preaching, massive buildings constructed, organization, organizers and church growth gurus galore, skilled preachers abound, but where, oh where, is the prophet of God? It's time. God is about to call out to this generation, and I wonder who's going to say, here am I. Let a new generation arise that cry with a voice this century, has never, this, this century has never heard because this generation has seen a vision that no one has ever seen. In the midst of the wilderness of materialism where serpents of lust bite and blind as we approach an ever-nearing Armageddon, may God send us a prophet. Are you praying with me? We need it. You keep thinking that if you get the right politician in office, everything will be all right. And they become corrupted by the same greed and dysfunction that every other politician before them has. You think if we do another massive crusade, and we do it and the city remains the same and unchanged, we need a prophetic voice. We need someone crying loud and sparing not and lifting up their voice like a trumpet to sow his people their sins in the house of Jacob, their transgressions. Thomas Macaulay, the British historian who died on the eve of the Civil War, wrote a warning to America. He said, your republic will be fearfully plundered and laid waste by barbarians in the 20th century. He's off by a little bit, but not much. As the Roman Empire was in the 5th century, with this difference, the Huns and Vandals ravaged the Roman Empire from without, but your Huns and Vandals will have been generated within your own country by your own institutions. This is why I wrote the book Encounter, because we are in need of a fresh touch from heaven. The Bible says in the book of Judges, chapter number 6, that there was a young man who was sifting weed in a wine press. He was trying to hide the harvest from the enemy because the enemy had overtaken God's people and threatened that any time they saw them harvesting, they would destroy the harvest and possibly kill the harvesters. And this young man went out to do what no one else was willing to do and risk his life to, to harvest some grain for his family. And as he's threshing wheat in the wine press, by the way, his name is Gideon. Everybody say Gideon. Gideon. We often refer to Gideon as, as a scared little weakling hiding out at a wine press. He was doing the most feared job in the village. He was a man of courage, a man of bravery, but a man of many questions. And as he's sifting wheat in the wine press, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Hail, thou mighty man of valor, God is with thee. And he says, What are you talking about, mighty man of valor? And in the middle of this visitation, as he's faced with an angelic intervention and a word from the Lord, he has a question that is an important question for us tonight. And as we begin our journey over the next few weeks, Gideon says, if this be true, where be all the miracles that I've heard of? If this is true, if what you're telling me is true, how come I've never seen it? The Bible says in Judges 2.10, there arose a generation that knew not God, neither the works thereof. And today there's a generation who has arisen who has not seen a real revival, culture-shaking revival, has not experienced the presence of God, and their question is the same. If it's true, then where is the power? That was the question of Gideon. Where is the power? We lost it. How do we get it back? That's what this book is about. It answers the question, where's the power? And a gentleman who was a standard bearer of a revival for decades and still is today, a general in the faith, got a hold of the manuscript and sent us this word concerning this book. He's a best-selling author, international speaker, books like I'm the Christian the Devil Warned You About and Critical Mass and Fresh Fire and bestsellers. He says, 
Until the left rose up to dismantle America, we had the luxury of seeing revival as a good thing, not as a matter of life and death. At this moment, it is unmistakable that all you and I love about our nation, everything that we hold dear, will be wiped out unless we see a towering, sin-convicting, signs and wonders outbreak. And we are running out of time. Encounter is not just a book. It is the right book for this moment. Don't just read it. Absorb it into your spirit. It is the word of the Lord for this desperate hour. It sounds the alarm, but more importantly, it infuses us with faith for an awesome intervention of God. Mario Murillo. Dr. Rod Parsley so graciously took the time to write the foreword to the book. And he says, encounter is indispensable in this hour. Pastor Alan Dedeo is not afraid to confront the problems and pressures of a culture gone mad in forthright fashion. He proves that there is much to be gained by a return to the discarded values of the past while refusing to be limited by the conventions or expectations of previous generations. Pastor Alan Dedito not only makes the same inquiry that Gideon made, but shows us the solution in unflinching and uncompromising detail. The answer to Gideon's dilemma and to ours is as simple in its resolution as it is profound in its implications. Where is the power? I challenge you not to ask the question unless you're ready to receive God's riveting and revolutionary response. Where is the power? It's in you. Hiding, lying dormant. It has been covered. Your spirit cluttered by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in. And in the name of Jesus, you are going to break out of this thing, shake off the debris, and rise up to be everything God has called you to be. There's a purpose for you. There's a plan for you. And it's time for you to accept it, to receive your orders from headquarters and to, in the affirmative, accept the mission that you have been given to reach a world that's gone mad. But we must pray for another Pentecost. We must pray for another outpouring of power. We must pray that the prophets of God arise with a word in their mouth coming from a vessel that is uncorrupted by the conditions of this world. Would you stand with me right now as we pray? I want us to really pray just for a few moments. I want us to begin to ask God. Some of you who are prayer warriors can find ushers. If you'll come receive the offering so that people can find their way down here to the altar and believe God with us. If you're a prayer warrior, get down here to the altar and stand in faith with us. Ushers, get down here and receive this. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. We need power. We need power. We need power for our families, for our marriages, for our children. We need power. And, oh, God, we have ignored your solutions for too long. Today we repent. We turn away from every distraction. We turn away from every hindrance. We turn away from everything that has corrupted our focus. We turn away from those things now, and tonight we turn to you. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Allen, I'm ready to turn toward God. In fact, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I'm ready to turn toward God and seek His power in my life. I'm ready to seek His presence in my life. Just raise your hands up in the air right now between you and God. Just raise your hands up in the air. You're watching online right now. Lift your hands with us. Now every hand lifted in the building as we pray. Come on, pray. God, I need you. God, I need you to move in my heart and in my spirit. God, I need you to do something in my life. If you're ready to pray with me, even if it means saying, here am I, send me, make your way down to this altar just for a moment. Make your way down to this altar and join me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here am I, send me. If you're ready to pray for the prophets to rise, come down to the altar and let's stand in agreement together. Let's believe God together. And I believe God will do what we ask him to do. 
There must be a restoration of the trust between the people and the prophet, but there must be a prophet arise whose message is moral because his life is, whose motives are moral. Father, give us some prophets. Raise them up. They may be in this building tonight. Raise up these young people to declare the word of the Lord, to remove every distraction from their lives. All of the trivial drama that young people deal with, adolescent and teens deal with, let them throw it in the trash and pursue you and pursue what it is you've called them to do. God, send us some prophets in the mighty name of Jesus. Now tell them you'll heed them when they come. <laughs> they won't be unpopular in your house. They won't be rejected in your house. Bless a prophet in the name of a prophet, and you shall receive a prophet's reward. Give a cup of cold water in the name of a prophet, and you will in no wise lose your reward. Raise them up, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you go right now and find seven people and give them a hug and tell them, I believe God's going to use you in this time, in this day, in this hour. Go ahead. Go find seven people. Can I see that card? Come on. Go find seven people on the way back to your seat. Tell them God's going to use you in this hour. All right, ushers, you can be seated. You can be seated just for a moment. And you can keep this duo on lightly in the background. Ushers, pass these out quickly, quickly. Pass these out quickly. Those of you watching online, you can go to www.theencounterbook.com in order to get a hold of your copy. Hallelujah. Go ahead, be seated, be seated. I want to talk to you for a minute. Can I talk to you for a minute? Huh? Can I talk to you for a minute? It's Pentecost and I was brief. So I can talk to you for a minute. Bring it down just a little bit more. How many of you want to get copy? How many of you want to get a copy or two? So here's what we're doing. Our vision, our goal is to get thousands of copies of this book spread across the whole wide world. I know you want to get yourself a copy but I want you to help me get a copy to the other side of the world. I want you to help me get a copy to Israel. And I want you to help me get a copy in the hands of pastors and politicians so they can see where we lost the power and how we can get it back. So here's what we've done. We have a pre-order card right here. A pre-order card right here. If you haven't already ordered your books, here's what we're believing for. 2,000 books spread across the world as quickly as possible before the official release of this book. This is the pre-release. The official release is not till fall. So here's what we're praying for, 2,000 copies all over the world between now and September. So I believe God with me for that. Everybody say 2,000 copies. Now that is achieved easily if I can get 10 people to buy 100 books. That's 1,000 books. Boom. Done. How much is 100 books? Well, at the discounted price, it's $797, $797. Or, or excuse me, in addition to, I need 20 people who can do 50 books. That's $400. I'm not asking you to do that necessarily tonight. I'm just telling you what the vision is. 10 people to do 100, 20 people to do 50, and that's 2,000 books. 50 books is $400. And what you can do is you check on here, and you say, how many want? I want 50 books. And you go back there and pay, and you can say, well, when they come in, I'm going to take 10, and then you spread 40 out. Or you tell us how many you want to keep. If you want to keep 40 and give us 10 to spread out, whatever you want to do, or however you want to do it, we're believing for 2,000 copies to spread out. Well, is that going to help us make money? No. We will not make back the money we spent producing this book. That's impossible. Now, with God, all things are possible. But that's an impossible. So, so there's no way to do that. That's not the purpose behind this. We just need you to help us get the message out. Hallelujah. 
So here's what we got. Here's the pre-order discount prices, and these will go up in the next week or two. But this is what we have now. For one book, it's $12. For two books, it's $20. For anything above 10, it's $7.97 a piece. $7.97 a piece. And what we're going to do, you're watching online, you can go to theencounterbook.com, www.theencounterbook.com, and place your order and get a, get a hold, and we'll have them shipped to you as soon as they come in. In fact, with that, I'm going to say goodbye to our online audience. Go check out the website. You get to see what other national ministries have said about this book, who's endorsed it. You can download a free copy of it and or a sample copy of it, the first three chapters, and start reading that. Get a hold of this book and help us take it to the whole wide world. Hallelujah. Somebody thank God for our online audience. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time right here at ECC. All right, those of you that are here, here's what we're